This is a picture of power. Let me explain. It was the year 2000, and my daughter was attending a prestigious and expensive private school in Cairo, Egypt, where I was a professor at the American University in Cairo. One day they announced a field trip to the Cairo Zoo, and they called for parents to come as helpers to herd the children. I had never been to the Cairo Zoo, and I had no classes that day, so I volunteered to go. I was the only man to go. Uh, the other two parents were uh, parents of two Korean children. When we arrived, our bus was met by a zookeeper. This was not a normal service, but we came from the most expensive private school in Egypt. As the zookeeper took us around the zoo, he would open the cages and bring out the animals and allow us to hold them or pet them or feed them. And at each animal, with only two exceptions, he would first offer the opportunity to my daughter, who invariably accepted with glee in the face of my efforts to say, um, honey, why don't we let one of the other kids have a turn? In the meantime, our group was being shadowed by a boy of about nine or ten who told me his name was Muhammad. He was wearing a well-worn sweater with holes in it. He was very dirty. Uh, it was obvious he was skipping school. He had latched on to us because wherever we went, the animals were coming out of their cages, and he wanted this opportunity to see them up close and personal. The zookeepers, seeing that he was not a member of our select group, kept trying to get rid of him. At one point, they even went so far as to strike him. And I intervened twice. The first time I told them that it didn't matter if he was with our group. And the second time when I saw them strike him, I intervened and, and told them not to do that in front of the school children. I was angry. I was angry that they would treat him this way. And I wanted to tell them off. And I didn't. And I didn't do it because I did not want to embarrass the kindergarten teacher who had set this up. Uh, I didn't want to make a scene in front of the school children. And I didn't want to cause problems for the school that had arranged the trip and where my daughter was enrolled. Finally, the zookeepers ushered us into the observation area for the lions, and as they did so, uh, once I was in with my daughter, they managed to close the door so that Muhammad was not able to enter. And when we came out, Muhammad was gone. So what's happening here? This is a story about privilege. I was overprivileged, and Muhammad was underprivileged. I didn't ask for privilege. It was given to me because of my place in a social hierarchy over whose creation and structure I had no control. Just by being me, the only father in the group, the only man in the group, a white male professor at one of the best and most expensive universities in Africa, I am at the top of, a, of an Egyptian class hierarchy. I'm at the top of an education hierarchy, a gender hierarchy, a race hierarchy, and an age hierarchy. This is about social stratification, permanent inherited inequality between the various component groups of which the society is composed. Through her kinship with me, my daughter has power. She can be the first student called again and again to hold or pet or feed the animals. By power here, I mean the capacity of people to exert their will on others. You can see power in any situation of conflict, from who's going to get to pet the animals at the zoo to whether a country seeks a military or a diplomatic solution to a problem. Usually, the person who gets their way has the most power, or at least the greater capability to exert that power. The ways in which power relations especially unequal power relations, affect human social affairs is called politics. From an anthropological perspective, power is best considered not in terms of force, but as a social and cultural problem. The problem of power is a problem of how to deal with difference. Why? Well, as the political philosopher Hannah Arendt noticed, every society must deal with others from whom one cannot escape and with whom one must share the world. Politics involves the co-presence in the political arena of actors with alternative understandings and competing. Every society seeking consensus is faced with two key problems of difference then. The organization of internal diversity and relations with external communities. What does a society do with people who refuse to comply with social norms, values, and accepted practices? Where does the society draw the line as to how much variation from the norm is too much? One way that societies deal with people whose behavior is too different in some aspect 
is to have their identities socially reclassified. When someone is labeled as insane, officials in a given society may be authorized to monitor them, medicate them, restrict their movements, and even incarcerate them. When someone gets labeled criminal, officials may be authorized to restrict their movements, incarcerate them, interrogate or torture them, even to kill them. Similarly, when someone is labeled a witch, officials may be authorized to restrict their movements, to incarcerate them, to interrogate or torture them, uh, or to kill them. Witches, lunatics, and criminals are categories of person outside the normal systems of stratification that are operating in any given society, but one's place in the social hierarchy makes it easier or harder for the state to recategorize what kind of person someone is and therefore treat them with these extreme levels of control. The second political problem, the second kind of difference that societies must deal with, is that of relations with external societies who have different goals and competing political projects, including the establishing of the boundaries, not only geographical but social and cultural, that separate groups of people and make them different societies, different states, different nations. There are two common ways to deal with external communities, negotiation and force. The most common form of negotiation is mediation, the use of a formally recognized third party to assist in the settling of differences between groups in conflict. Mediation can involve the formal signing of a treaty, or it can be a ritual process through which social bonds are restored, or the brokering of a marriage between two disputing kin groups, or payment of blood wealth by one side to another. There are many, many different forms of mediation in the world. The other method of settling disputes between competing groups is force. A common use of force is raiding. Raiding is the short-term use of force with a limited goal, such as stealing a few head of cattle or some other material goods from a neighboring group. Raiding may lead to, or it may be part of, ongoing feuding between two groups. Feuding involves ongoing, chronic hostilities between groups of neighbors or kin, such that when they meet, hostilities are likely to break out. Finally, there's warfare. Violent conflict involving entire societies mobilized against each other, each usually seeking to kill as many members of the other society as possible until one side surrenders to the other. These categories are not mutually exclusive, quite the contrary. One can imagine a scenario in which a raid causes an incident, such as the death of uh, a member of the community that's being raided. This in turn leads to a feud with escalating hostilities that eventually break into outright warfare, eventually requiring mediation to restore nonviolent relations between the two groups. Within societies, anthropologists usually speak of two forms of power, consensus and coercion. Consensus is social action produced in accordance with social norms through people's freely given assent. Consensus is uh, any time that you agree to do something you don't want to do because you know it's the right thing to do. I want to run that red light, but I don't do it because I understand that those rules exist so that I won't get into accidents. A system of power that's based on consensus is called a hegemony. The use of force, symbolic and physical, to generate or constrain particular social actions is called coercion. My decision not to do something because I'm afraid that I will be arrested and tortured and, and capitulating to that fear, that's coercion. And a system of power based on coercion is called domination. So look at this picture. What kind of power is this? If you said coercion, you aren't wrong. The schoolyard bully shaking some kid down for his lunch money is an archetype of coercion. And yet, such bullying cannot exist without a system of rules that the participants adhere to. Bullied children often don't reveal that they've been bullied because the social consequences of tattling are more severe and pervasive than victimization. And in many places, those running the school turn a blind eye, claiming that children need to learn how to deal with such behavior from one another in order to become adults. Similarly, choosing not to run a red light is rarely a clear choice between consent to the norms that justify traffic lights versus not wanting to get a ticket. In nearly all cases, 
coercion and consensus can be found to operate in tandem wherever we find power operating in a system. Now, when we speak of power in terms of coercion and consensus, the image that usually comes to our minds is one of social constraints, symbolic or physical, on the agency of a human person. That is, our freedom is constrained, knowingly or unknowingly, by these social forces pressing down on us. But there's another way to think about this that puts the agency of the person at the center. This is an approach that asks how we, as persons, discipline ourselves in response to both coercive practices and systems of ideas that tell us how we're supposed to act. The originator of this approach was the social philosopher Michel Foucault, who said that power needs to be considered as a productive network, which runs through the whole social body. Social actors discipline themselves in order to produce valued goods and services. If a person wants to make something, to make art, or a law, or a child, they must discipline themselves to the structures that let them do so. Subjecting themselves to social structure allows them to accomplish things. But social actors also discipline themselves to simultaneously produce rewards. Pay, promotion, status, identity, uh, fantasy. I get paid for my art, for example, and it brings me status and makes me feel good about my identity as an artist. In making contributions and subjecting oneself to institutional practices, though, Social actors contribute to reproducing the system that forces them to act in particular ways. Obviously, my making a scene would not have overturned the system, and it would have had embarrassing consequences for my reputation. But it would have also drawn attention to the fact that we were engaged in actively maintaining a system that disenfranchised an Egyptian citizen because he was young and poor and gave excessive privilege to a foreigner who was, by local standards, wealthy and well-connected. So, the takeaway from this story is that the system, whatever the system is in whatever society you live in, is always extremely hard to overthrow. It's hard to resist, it's hard to change. But it also reminds us that one of the reasons it's hard to overturn is that most of us, most of the time, would rather violate the ethical and moral principles that the society tells us we're supposed to believe in than violate the social rules of politeness and how to behave. That politeness and etiquette can help maintain the whole system of unequal distribution of wealth, power, and privilege is because discipline is tied to public performance. Social action always has audiences, and these audiences can exert social sanctions, but they rarely need to, because most of us discipline ourselves to accommodate what we think our audiences expect of us. And this takes us to a variation on a point that we've made several times in this class. Human institutions, including those that manage power and conflict, like family, army, court, or nation, are cultural creations. For them to work, we must recreate them on a daily basis through our everyday practices. And in doing so, we also create and maintain systems of power.